We have a treat today. We have one of our missionaries here uh, that we support who's going to be bringing a, a word for us today, a word from God's word for us. And uh, Garrett Harmon. Come on up, Garrett. Yeah. Uh, Garrett is a missionary at the University of Oregon uh, with Northwest Collegiate Ministry. And uh, I have a privilege of hanging out with Garrett about once a month. We, we are part of a, a minister's group that gets together and, and prays together and studies together and, and has lunch together. And uh, boy, I'll tell you what, it is sure a privilege to have Garrett as a friend and to partner with him in ministry. And so what a blessing uh, it is to have him here today to, to challenge us from God's Word. So thank you, Garrett, for being here. I'm pretty quiet. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm a pretty quiet individual, so if you can't hear me, it's all right to yell at me and tell me to speak up or slow down. I'm working on it. Um, but it really is a privilege to be here with you guys this morning. Um, I'm so thankful for Pastor Toby and Pastor Matt. Um, they're such an encouragement to me on campus and my staff. Um, right now we have a staff of four. Um, there's three guys and one lady. Um, the downside is most of our st students are girls right now because for whatever reason they seem to be more interested in Jesus than guys. I don't know why that is in college, but we're working on it. Um, but it really is good to be here with you this morning. Um, I recognize several of your faces from when I was here in the fall, um, and so it's good to be back. Um, today I get to share with you something that God's placed on my heart that He has been challenging me through and wrestling with um, in, in both my ministry and my own personal life. Um, and so we'll get to that here in a second. Um, but as Pastor Toby said, uh, my name is Garrett Harmon. Um, I'm the director of Northwest Collegiate Ministries at U of O and at Lane Community College. Um, and we're also starting stuff at Bushnell, uh, Bushnell University. It used to be Northwest uh, Christian University. Um, they're changing their name, um, or have. Uh, but I've been in this role now for three years. Um, it's been a really weird three years. I landed on campus about five months before the world shut down. Um, and college ministry looked radically different after COVID. Um, and it's been sweet. Um, it, this spring has felt the first normal spring since everything has shut down. Uh, for the first time, from the time that things shut down, that was what, 2020, I believe, uh, March of 2020, from that point on, campus looked radically different. You had to wear masks in the building. Uh, for about seven months, if you did not have a UVO student ID, you weren't allowed in the student building, into classrooms, into the library. Um, it was really restrictive. Um, and so uh, for about a year and a half, our team, uh, we prayed, we asked God, what, are, what do you want us to do? Um, the students that we were connected with had our, all graduated and transferred out. Um, and so we had this new group of staff that came on literally in the middle of in the middle of COVID, didn't have any relationship. And so we spent about a year, year and a half praying. We, we were diligent in doing what we could, but the, the center part of that was prayer, asking God to move in, uh, in a mighty way. Um, and it's been cool now that his ministry has, has come back um, and when I say come back, it's been there the whole time, but now looking more normal, um, God has been faithful to continue to move. Um, and I think those prayers God has heard, he's heard your guys' prayers for us too. And so for that, I'm so thankful. Um, so I just want to give you a quick report of what's happened on campus before I jump into our passage for today. Um, right now, on Wednesday nights, we have a thriving girls' Bible study, women's Bible study. They meet every Wednesday, and that group has continued to grow every week. Um, so much so that there's even non-believers that are coming to this Wednesday Bible study where they are digging into God's Word and challenging each other to be faithful to that. It's been a really sweet and wonderful um, celebration. Uh, we also, Thursday nights, we do a... Basically, we call it gather because we're all gathering together over a meal. Sometimes it's corn dogs, but uh, if you can count that as a meal, we do. Um, but we gather together, we eat, we play games together. Um, and one of the sweet things is more often than not, we have more lost believers, or as Pastor Toby said, yet to be believers, than we do have Christians. Um, and that's why we're on campus. We're missionaries. We love to, to connect in with the Christians on campus, but that's really not why we're there. We're there to share the gospel with the lost. 
U of O is about 0.3 thousand students. And we believe there's about two to 300 of them that are actually followers of Jesus. Um, this last Friday, uh, I guess two Fridays now for Good Friday, we joined together with four other ministries um, to, to have a Good Friday service. Um, this is the first time we've been able to do this since COVID shut everything down. Um, and it was really sweet that as we had all these groups brought all their students together, and we invited as many friends as we could, we got to worship Jesus' name in a business building uh, on campus. And there's about 100 of us. Um, and it was so sweet. Afterwards, we did a pizza fellowship where we then fed almost twice that many people. Um, and through the pizza, we got to share the gospel. Uh, one of those opportunities was an international student that came um, up and was like, what? What are you guys doing? We had a bunch of tables and chairs. There's a bunch of us hanging around. Like, what are you doing? What's up with this? And I was like, well, we're, we're a bunch of Christians that are coming together to worship Jesus and celebrate Good Friday. And I was like, what's Good Friday? Because he's an international student. Like, I saw it on my calendar. What is, what is this random holiday that makes this good? And we're like, well, here, I'll, let me tell you about it. And it was just the easiest on route to the gospel that I've ever had in my entire life. Um, but it was cool because there's this international student from an Asian country they got to hear the gospel. And at that event, we, we got to share the gospel with two or three other people that were not actually in the worship service, which was really sweet. Um, but before, once again, before I jump in, I just want to say thank you guys. We cannot do what we do at the U of O um, at Lane without your prayers. Um, it's been a hard season, um, but God has been really faithful. And we're so thankful that we get to be your missionaries to the U of O's campus. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, to today's passage. We're going to be in Colossians 1, 24 through 29. Um, I've titled the sermon as Struggling to Grow. Uh, some of this might be because I have a, a daughter that's 19 months, and so I've been watching her grow and process through um, that, that experience. Uh, but I think that's also really the heart of our passage um, as we're going to look at what it takes to grow and be mature in our faith. I think this is a really important topic coming out of Easter um, because that was the most important event in history that just happened, especially for us as Christians. Because the tomb is now empty. Jesus is alive. He's rose. And, if we, believe that this, uh, and we believe that this is true, that this actually happened, that Jesus has defeated death. Um, and so I think today's passage really will be, now that the tomb is empty, what are we going to do about it? What do we do about it as Christians? So to get us in the right frame of mind, I just want to share a quick story about my childhood. Um, I grew up playing a lot of sports. Uh, my favorite sports were all contact-based, such as football and wrestling. I think a big part of this was I had a little brother, but I think the second part was generally I was bigger than most of my classmates were uh, for most of my life. So by the time I was in fifth grade, I was the third tallest football player in, our, in, our, in my grade. Um, it was great. But then something really awful happened. I stopped growing. So from middle school to high school, I didn't grow at all. I'm the same height I was in middle school. It's brutal. Uh, my knees hurt really bad because I grew really fast. And then it stopped. And so slowly, year after year, I don't know if you guys have ever taken a, a picture. They line you up all by height. And the height, tall people get in the back. And they put you from the tallest to the shortest. And then they go down and down and down until you get to the short people. Uh, my wife is one of those people. Um, but you go, um, so I always started towards the back. And then slowly, year after year, I moved further and further down the line until finally I was in the middle. Normally, this isn't a problem. But when you're trying to be a lineman, you want to be the biggest and strongest, and I was not. Um, so I was 5'10", 190 pounds, competing against 280, 300-pound, 6'4", 6'5", guys. I had stopped growing. And so I got to this point by the time my senior year happened that it finally caught up to me. I couldn't compete at the position I was in anymore. Something had to change. And so I was looking, I was like, well, I can try to be a lineman, but this isn't going to work. I get pushed around. I'm too small. So I'm going to change positions. But the problem is, as I change positions, all I'd ever done my entire life was be a lineman. I was not fast enough to be a, a running back. I didn't have the hands because I was a lineman to be a wide receiver. Um, I was stuck in this place where I really couldn't compete. And so my senior year, I didn't do a whole lot um, because I didn't grow. I had no control over my physical growth growing up. Because to be honest, if I did, I probably would be seven foot right now and probably in professional sports. Unlike physically, though, we can inf influence our spiritual growth. And so once again, this passage of scripture that we're going to see this morning is Colossians 1, 24 through 29. And we're going to see that in order to grow spiritually, 
We must first suffer with Christ. We must share about Christ. And we must struggle to make uh, struggle uh, for Christ. Um, and if we as believers do not do these things, if we do not struggle for the sake of our neighbors and friends, uh, and so that way they can know fully the gospel, then we will struggle to grow spiritually. So Pastor Toby mentioned that you guys have been walking through the book of Genesis. Um, so this week, once again, we're going to be in Colossians. I just want to give you kind of a quick blurb uh, of what Colossians is. Um, it's a letter written by the Apostle Paul. Most likely, um, scholars kind of differ on this, but while he's in, in prison in Rome. Uh, and the church that he was writing to was the Church of Colossae, which is in modern-day Turkey. Uh, it's a very similar letter to Ephesians and the letter of Philemon, most likely um, they could have even been delivered together. Um, and we're able to see really that this young church plant is facing a cultural wrong teaching that attacks Jesus' authority um, and who he is as his position as God. And I think that's one of the reasons why Colossians is such a great book to go to to gain a solid foundation of who Jesus is and how we're able to walk as believers following him. So let's go ahead and jump in. We're going to be in Colossians 1, 24 through 29. Let me read this. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Let me pray. Uh, God, thank you uh, for your word. God, thank you, um, God, that we can just turn to it. Um, God, that we can see what is true. Um, God, thank you that the tomb is empty, that you have defeated death. Um, and God, that we can sit here and worship you, worship what you've done, and talk about what do we do now? What's next? Um, and so God, I pray as we look at this passage, God, will you just um, help us grow, help us grow spiritually so we don't struggle to. God, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. So in these six verses, Paul's laying out, basically laying it all out on the line and telling how he does ministry and why he does it. And really, it's so that way God's word can be fully known. We see that over and over and over idea, this idea of Paul making sure that God's word is fully known. So in verse 24, Paul says this statement, that he is able to rejoice in his sufferings. I'm going to say that one more time because this, to me, was really caught, caught my eye. He can rejoice in his sufferings. It's really hard to understand how really anyone can rejoice in, in their sufferings. Um, I'm not very good at this. Uh, I tend to complain. You can talk to my wife. Uh, I tend to complain when I, when I start suffering. But I think the second part of verse 24, he, Paul then goes on to explain how he can do the seemingly par- um, hard conflicting thing or rejoicing while he's suffering um, and it says this um, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church Paul is able to rejoice in his sufferings because he's suffering like his Savior and Lord he realized that Jesus had suffered first on the cross for him and so because his his Savior, His Lord, the one that He's supposed to follow has done it, He too can do it. And he's doing it for the benefit of the church. That benefit is that the Word of God can be fully known. Going back to that key part, that the, that the Word of God can be fully known. This verse is not saying that Christ was lacking anything in His actions in regards to salvation. I think that's one of the easiest ways that this verse can be twisted. That Paul is saying, man, Christ sacrificed on the cross. That something was lacking in this. No. We can see very clearly in Colossians 1, 19 and Colossians 2, 2, which is right before this and right after this, that there is nothing lacking in Christ's sacrifice on the cross. That he paid for it all and that it is finished at that point in time. So if that's the case, if nothing is uh, lacking in his, uh, in, 
in his uh, sacrifice. Now, what is Paul talking about? Um, I think that what Paul's talking about here is that what we're lacking is really a, a, a physical experience and that we weren't there to see Jesus die on the cross. The people that Paul was talking to, the, the church of Colossae, they were not there to see the crucifixion happen. They're closer than we were, probably about 40 to 50 years, but they still not physically see that. And that, that is that moment that we're lacking. Because I think it's, it's really easy uh, for us to, to see it, but forget it when we weren't there personally to experience it. Um, and so Paul is able to rejoice in his suffering because he's suffering like a savior. Um, sorry, I lost myself. Um, last week we celebrated and remembered what Christ did on the cross. Today, as modern believers, we're able to read about it in the Bible. We're able to hear about it, hear about the story. We're even able to watch movies or play versions of it. But the reality is none of us are able to go back 2,000 years. I wish we could to the time machine and see what happened. But we physically can't go back to that moment. This doesn't make it any less true of an event just because we weren't able to see it. But I think it does make it easier for us to forget what Jesus did because we didn't personally watch it happen. I think this is where Paul, who suffered on behalf of the gospel, was able to set an example like Christ was in order to give this experience to see somebody, a faithful follower of Jesus, suffer for the sake of the mission of God. Paul suffered so that way God's word would be spread and would be fully known. And through his suffering, Paul rejoices and worship God. And his followers watched him do this. They saw his commitment and this faith and encouraged him to do so likewise. Just a reminder that Paul's writing this letter in prison, waiting to hear if he will be sentenced to death for this very action of sharing the gospel. He's modeling what this looks like. And so through Paul's suffering and his attitude, the gospel was able to be spread and be made fully known. He did not complain that he had to suffer, nor did he stop doing what would lead to suffering, sharing about God. Instead, he rejoiced that he was allowed to do this, that he was allowed to share the gospel message. I think this attitude of rejoicing in God, no matter what, spoke to the truth of the message that he presented, because it was worth it. So I think this is why we as, when we as Christians suffer, we should strive to do so in a way that testifies to the redemptive work of the gospel. In my own walk with the Lord, when I see Christians walk through hardship, but still are able to rejoice and celebrate the Lord, it impacts me greatly. I think there's been two examples in my life where I've seen good friends walk through really hard situations. Both of them are faithful followers of the Lord. And both of the last several years had to receive terrible news that their wives may not survive the medical treatment that they were facing. And in both of them, both them and their wives, they turned and worshiped to God. They continued the ministry that God had called them to, to share about God, make, making His word fully known. And they for faithfully proclaimed the gospel. I can only guess that they probably had angry moments with the Lord as they were asking, why? Why do I have to suffer? Why do we have to experience this? Why do I have to, does my wife have to go through this? But their faith led them to still rejoice and led them, and their example spoke more to me than any sermon or word that they ever told me. So our first point that we see from verse 24 is that as Christians, we are to rejoice as we, are, as we suffer with Christ. This then leads us to an important question. What do we suffer for? There's a lot of great causes in the world. To save turtles, to recycle, be green, to be a good person even. These are all great causes. There's a million other words. Everyone tends to have a cause that they get behind. But I think there's only one single cause that's eternal. Let's look at the next couple of verses to see what Paul has to say about this. So let's look at 25 through 27. And he says this, Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This cause that Paul is called to, that he is a minister and that he was, has been given stewardship over, is the cause of making the word of God fully known. In verse 26, it says that Paul um, says the word of God is a mystery that was once hidden, but now has been revealed to the saints or to the believers. The fullness of God's word is the life, death, 
and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is through Jesus that God has revealed himself to the world, and it is Jesus that is the stumbling block that we all have to wrestle through. Jesus has given his followers, the saints, the stewardship of the task of making the word of God, the gospel, fully known. Let's look at two well-known scripture references to see that this is true. We're going to see this in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and Acts 1, 8. Uh, Acts 1 8. Um, in both of these, we see that there's this mission that God has called us to, that we're going to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I command you. And behold, I'm with you always. In Acts 1 8, we see he calls us to certain places Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. God has given us this mission to go and be his witness. So, what does it mean to be the steward of the gospel? Let's first consider what does stewardship mean. If you're a fan of Lord of the Rings, there's a great example of a poor leadership. Um, but we won't talk about Lord of the Rings in case you're not. Um, but that's a good, good place to look as well. Um, but who here owns a pet? Do you guys own a pet at home? Okay, everyone does. Great. Um, so I like dogs, so we'll look at dogs. Uh, when an owner of a dog goes out of town, they normally have to find a dog sitter. As a college student, this was a great way uh, to have a side hustle um, because you made a lot of money doing it. Um, it was great. So let's say the owner of the dog selects me to be the dog sitter. I am now the steward of the dog. This is a really great thing to put on your resume. It's very official. Um, it's great. Um, but as the steward of the dog, I'm now responsible to feed, to walk, and to care for the dog on the owner's behalf. If the owner comes home to a famished dog, or even worse, a dead dog, I'm a terrible steward of the dog. Because I was entrusted with the dog's well-being on the owner's behalf. That's what it means to be a steward. So if we bring this back to our passage, God has given his followers the stewardship of the gospel message. And if we are to be faithful stewards of that message, we must be faithful like the owner to go and share it. And this is our next point, that as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we must go and share the gospel message and make it fully known. We are to share about Christ. Just a side note, because I'm a Bible nerd, Paul is intentionally in his choice of words in 27 when he says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, there was a false belief that was really attacking this early young church. Um, what exactly is, is hard to tell. We really can only see from the letter. Um, but most scholars say it's some early form of Gnosticism mixed with Jewish traditions. Um, and basically what this is saying, Gnosticism is this process that in order to be marked as a follower of Jesus, you have this higher understanding of the divine being. Um, and so when this is mixed then with, with Israel tradition or Jewish traditions, um, basically it's saying that in order to have this experience with God, to know God, you have to do all these different things. You have to follow the Sabbath. You have to follow the food rules of the time. You have to do all these things. And when you do these things, then you're going to experience God in a unique way that marks you as a believer. And Paul is directly refuting that. He's saying, no, the mission of God is fully known in Jesus Christ. It is only through him. Um, we'll see this over and over in Colossians. So I think this helps us as we understand when, when he's using mystery, it's not this confusing topic. No, he's directly attacking what this church is saying. Saying, no, it is in Jesus Christ alone that the mystery of the world, the mystery of God is fully understood in Jesus Christ. So far, so far we have seen, first, that we are to suffer with Christ. And secondly, that we are to share about Christ. And our third point we're going to see in verses 28 and 29. So let's go ahead and read those really fast. So once again in verse 28. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. In these two verses, Paul is active. He's proclaiming about Jesus. He's sharing about Jesus so others can be mature in Christ. Paul toils and he struggles, and he's doing all this in God's power. Paul struggled. He struggled so that way Gentiles can hear the gospel message. He struggled so people can fully understand the gospel message. And he struggled to share the gospel and to disciple young believers. Paul struggled for others. The church that is receiving this letter is a young church. 
It was actually planted by a disciple of Paul, and not Paul himself. Um, his name, I'm awful with names, so we'll try the best, is Ephrates. Ephrates. Um, and then to disciple, he discipled this, this person to go and plant this church and to help others know the word of God fully. Paul is always struggling to share the gospel and to disciple and raise up the next leaders of the church. I think at times we as the church struggle with this. We say, hey, in ministry, we need to spend more time sharing with those that are not yet believers. But then as we spend time doing that, then people are like, no, 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 we need to spend time discipling and raising up the young believers and teaching them how to follow the Lord. And we say that there's a conflict here, but really they're intertwined. They're one and the same. Because if we do not struggle to share the gospel with those that don't know, the mission of God is not going to happen. They're never going to hear the word of God. And on the reverse side, though, if we don't struggle once they become believers to help them grow and share with others, the mission of God is not going to move anywhere. It's just going to be us. If we fail to accomplish either side of this, we're going to fail to accomplish the mission of God that we're stewards over. And this leads us to our third point, that as followers of Jesus, we must struggle for Christ. We must struggle to make known the gospel, and we must struggle to help teach others how to do so as well. We must struggle on behalf of those in our life. My daughter, I think, has painted a really beautiful picture for me in this regard. Um, She's a 19-month extrovert, uh, just like my wife. Um, She can say about 25 words that almost everyone can understand, but then she speaks another, like, 2,000 words that I think only her and maybe her best friends can understand. Um, But she's an expert. She constantly is chatting, constantly talking. It's amazing. I love her a lot. But one of the things, as an extrovert, is that she wants to sit at the table with us. Um, Not just for dinner time. Anytime we're sitting down, she wants to go up. And so what she does is she'll go up to the chair, um, and she's about this tall, and our chair is about this tall. So she'll go up, and she will stroll with all that she is, and she will grab the back of the chair. There's like little poles, and she'll grab it as hard as she can. And she'll try to get her little legs up, and she'll struggle, and she'll fall. And she'll try again, and she'll struggle, and she'll do it again and again. She'll struggling to try to get on this chair over and over and over again until finally she gets her leg up and she sits down and she is pleased with herself because now she can talk. Um, That's my daughter in a nutshell. But I think this example of her just struggling over and over and over again to accomplish her task, this is the type of struggle that we need to have to accomplish God's mission as well. Over and over and over again, we don't quit. We don't give up. It doesn't matter how hard it is. It doesn't matter how difficult it is. It doesn't matter if even if it looks like it's impossible. We struggle again and again and again and again. Sometimes what it takes is me helping her get up. And that's God. Sometimes there's a mission that we can't do without God's help. But we have to struggle over and over again for the sake of those in our life. In the last verse, it says that Paul toils and struggled with all his energy that it powerfully works within me. Paul rightly realized that he is but a steward of the gospel, not the owner. God is the owner, and he has the power to draw and change the hearts of the lost. And we can do the best that we can do, but without God, nothing's going to happen. We have to work in God's power, and the only way to do that is by spending time with him. Through Colossians 1, 24-29, we see three points that we as Christians are to do to follow in Jesus' example that will lead to spiritual growth. They're that we are to suffer with Christ, we are to share about Christ, and we are to struggle on behalf of Christ or for Christ. These three points individually don't make us mature. They're not some secret sauce like Cane's or Chick-fil-A. But growing spiritually means to look more like Jesus every day. Jesus constantly and regularly did these three things and challenged then his followers to do likewise. So if we are to look more like Jesus, we need to do these things. So looking back at my shoulder grow, there came a point where I had stopped growing. It took almost six years before the consequences of that caught up to me. And I finally had come face to face with the lack of my size, and I couldn't change anything. Spiritually, if we're not careful, we can also stop growing. And instead of suffering with Christ, we seek what is easy. Instead of sharing, we are quiet. Instead of struggling on behalf of our neighbors, we ride off in the sunset and do nothing. It may take time for the lack of spiritual growth to catch up. But at some point, we will reflect on our lives and realize that opportunities we we did not take and places we could have 
but did not struggle for the faith. But the good news is that it's not too late. Where are you struggling with faith today? Is that you do not know Jesus and have not placed your faith in Him? If so, then you can do that right now. I challenge you, don't let another day pass when you can have the joy of walking with the Lord. If this is you, I challenge you to respond and turn to the Lord in faith. To do this, it's both easy and hard. It's a simple conversation with God that you're sharing your need for a Savior, that you cannot do it yourself, and that you believe that Jesus died and rose again in having defeated death. And finally, that you're giving lordship of your life to Him. Your life is no longer yours, but God's. If, this, if you do this, I challenge you to talk to Pastor Toby or Pastor Matt, or really anyone, because we want to celebrate with you. This is one of the most important moments of your life. So I challenge you to respond that way. Secondly, your struggle may be that there are people in your life that, have not, that you have not shared Jesus with. It may have been over many years that you've had the opportunities, but you constantly have said no. I challenge you today to leave here and go and share with them about Jesus. To struggle for them, maybe first in prayer and in effort, so that way they can come to know Jesus. As you struggle, I believe that you'll continue to grow in your faith. Thirdly, your struggle may be that there are people in your life that you've not discipled. They may be young believers, that they need help growing. Um, you may be been too busy or occupied to really give them time to help grow in Christ. So as you leave here, I challenge you to take one intentional effort to just helping them grow spiritually, to walking in this process. Maybe it looks like going and grabbing coffee or dinner. I know for me, my first step this week as I've been wrestling with this and God has been changing my heart, is that there's two guys that I know um, that I need to reach out to and set up a meal with. And we just need to sit down and see where they're at. So as I pray, I ask you to respond as God leads. God, thank you um, so much for your word. God, thank you for just the way that you have challenged us. God, the way that you grow us. Um, God, that there's a promise that you will be with us as we go about your mission. Um, God, we, we are so thankful for all that you're doing. Um, and God, I pray that as we wrestle through Colossians 1, um, God, we really will see your, your investment in our lives. God, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen.